Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my lecture on dimension reduction. A good question to start with is why is that important? So first of all, nowadays we live in an information society. So what does that mean? So that means that in the last 20 years the amount of data has increased substantially. Yeah? So as time goes by, yeah, let's have here our time axis and here our data axis. As time goes by, the amount of data increases exponentially. Yeah, as an example is for, uh, one example is for instance the finance industry, yeah, where we have nowadays thick data. And as a result, new firms have emerged in the early 2000s that deal with or that are engaged in what is called algorithmic trading. Yeah? So obviously uh, this new data arrival has also led to new kinds of industries. Yeah? So we live in an inf information society, but there are also other types of information. Yeah? For instance, think about firms such as Facebook or Google. Yeah? These firms have a huge amount of data, often personal data, from individuals who make different, different posts uh, on, on Facebook, for instance, or Instagram. Yeah? So we have a huge amount of data and somehow we need to deal with that data. Yeah? And that is where dimension reduction comes into play. So one problem that we have with data is that as the amount of data increases, yeah, let now we have data here on the x-axis and here on the y-axis we have the noise. Yeah. As the amount of data increases, the noise increases, not linearly, but again exponentially. So it is important to note that data has two important components. One, on the one hand we have the signal and on the other hand we have the noise. Yeah? The noise is something that we are typically not interested in. We are interested in the signal. Yeah? So that's one important thing that we have to bear in mind. So I will give you now uh, a e simple example. I will read you a text and then afterwards you can think about, okay, or you should think about what is the signal here? What's the key message? What's the signal of that? So let's get started. So an example for our, for our understanding between signal and noise. Okay? So I went by food from my office to the car dealer. The car dealer has 25 cars. I checked the cars and chose the SUV. I paid for the car using my credit card. The car dealer needs to fix some administrative things and told me that I can pick up my car tomorrow in the afternoon. From tomorrow onwards, I do not need to go by food to my office, but I will drive with my car. So what's the key point here? What's the key message, the signal? So obviously the signal is here, I bought a car. I bought a car. Now you can, you can extract the signal by four single words. You can make it even, even shorter. You can, you, you can say the signal is car purchase. Only two, two letters, two words, car purchase. So the signal is giving the main message out of something, out of, out of a data, out of information. So as another example, consider the payoff of your often asset. Now we are in a finance environment. Yeah? An example from financial economics. Let's take this away. So what's the average payoff of your asset? Yeah? So what you will see is if this is the time axis and here is your asset payoff Payoff. So what you will see typically is the return distribution, 
which looks something like this. So that's the payoff and this information contains both noise and signal. If you're interested in the average payoff, uh, which is the signal here, it's obviously only this guy here. Yeah, it's the average payoff. Uh, that's denoted as payoff bar. Yeah? It's the average of your payoffs. That's the signal. The rest is the noise. So there's one big problem in social science. Let me just take this away here. Because we need some space. So in general, in social science, yeah, you will meet many different categories of, of people, but let's just as an example, you will meet sometimes two categories of people. Let's call it category category one and category two. Yeah? And we have two dimensions, let's say theory and methods. Theory and methods. So there's one category of uh, people that you meet in a scientific environment that are in category one. These are people who know, this, who know the theory very well, yeah? they know the theory very well, but they apply the wrong methods. Yeah? So they confuse the data in the data, the noise with the signal. Yeah? So you will, what we'll see later, that uh, about 80% of research and finance failed scientific replication. And the same pattern you see in other fields of science, such as psychology, same thing. So these are people who at, ne who at least know the theory, but they don't know the methods. Yeah? They use the wrong methods for the theory. The other group of people, category two, these are people who also, they, they don't know the methods either, yeah? and they don't even know the theory. Yeah. Have you ever heard about machine learning? And it's the same like with fashion for women. Yeah? So in the 1980s, there was a certain type of fashion up to date. Yeah? And then in the 90s, it, 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 it was out of date. Okay? And then 30 years later or so, the same fashion was up to date again. Yeah? And people thought it was something new. Yeah? because obviously they have forgotten about it, that, is, that this is nothing new, that's old passion from the 80s. The same thing is with machine learning. Yeah? Whenever you hear someone boasts with machine learning, yeah, then you know what's going on here. This is nothing new. It has been popular in the 80s, in the 90s, and that was that. And then for some reason, in the last couple of years, people talk about machine learning again, as if it would be something new. But it's nothing new, this is very old stuff. And people who post with machine learning skills, they don't, they don't even know the theory and they, and they use the wrong methods. What these people are doing is they give you some models that have, like, let's say, 99% data fit. Yeah? And what they fit with their models is the noise. Uh, and I call them idiots to their names, the face, and hopefully you will. You will, uh, I don't know what, what, what term you use, you would use in uh, Romania to call these guys. Oh, it's okay, idiots, yes. Yeah, idiots. I mean, they come in and then they wrote, they do some experiment and their experiments usually don't replicate half the time. And when they replicate, they replicate only under some weird conditions. And then to tell you that, you know what, this is wrong. But we are not interested in the noise, we are interested in the signal. So how can we reduce 
to the dimension of data so that we keep the signal but get rid of the noise. And the corresponding methods for this, for dimension reduction, are principal component analysis or factor analysis. So both methods have something in common, yeah? so they, they reduce the dimension of data but they are slightly different. Yeah? So it's like comparing a sports car with a truck. Yeah? So both obviously have the same purpose, yeah? they, the purpose of transportation, but they function somewhat differently. Yeah? So, and what we learn today, or what we learn in, in this lecture, the purpose is to give, to give you the license, the driver's license for the sports car. Yeah. And then you can learn by yourself how to drive the truck. That's the purpose or the objective of this lecture. So, and as a motivating example of uh, factor analysis, which is often used in the field of psychology, let us listen to a short uh, um, example from Dr. John Peterson, who is professor of psychology at the University of Toronto. And he will tell you some example how, uh, an example about how factor analysis is used, for instance, in psychology research. Here's the bare bones of the psychometric model of personality, so we'll call it roughly the Big Five model. And the reason it's called the Big Five model is because the psychometric investigations have indicated that you can specify human personality along five basic dimensions. You might ask, well, what exactly is personality? And, well, that's partly what we've been trying to wrestle with the entire course so far. And I would say, um, or what exactly is a trait? Think of a trait as an element of personality. And I think the best way to think about a trait is as a sub-personality. So you're, you're made up of sub-personalities that are integrated into something vaguely resembling a unity, but the unity is, is diverse. There are, there, are, there, are, there are describable, stable elements that characterize you, that are elements of your being. So for example, here's, here's some common ones. I might say, well, are you social or, or would you rather be alone? So here, here's a good question for you to define D decide whether you're extroverted or introverted. It's pretty straightforward, because that's, that's the first major dimension. Basically, if you take any set of questions about, any, any set of questions that could be applied descriptively to a human being, and you subject them to a, a statistical process called factor analysis, you can determine how they group together. So what I would be interested in, let's say I asked you 100 questions. Let's say I asked 100 questions of you and 100 other people. What I would find was that reliably, if some person answered question A, say on a scale of one to seven, six or seven, there would be other questions in the set of questions that they also tended to answer on the upper end of the scale. Or reliably, if they answered one question at the top of the scale, they'd answer another question at the bottom. That's a pattern of covariation. So you're looking for how the questions covary across large numbers of people. So let's say, here's a stupid example, but it's, it's really, it's really uh, straightforward, easy to understand. I might say, um, how often do you smile? One to seven. How often are you happy? One to seven. Well, what you'd find, obviously, is that people who tended to answer that they smiled a lot would also tend to answer that they were happy a lot. And so smiling and happy are not exactly the same thing, which is why we have two different phrases to describe them. But they're close enough so that they seem to be reflective of some underlying structure. And so that's what a factor analysis does. It allows you to take a, a large set of questions, to administer it to a large number of people, and then to statistically analyze it, looking how the questions relate to one another across the entire group, so that you can infer what the underlying structure is. Be be and here, here's the question in some sense. If I ask you 100 questions, how many questions am I really asking you? Because you might say, well, are you, do you smile a lot? Are you happy? Uh, do you wake up eager to start the day? And you say, well, is that one question asked three ways? Or is it three separate questions? And the answer is, well, if the answers reliably co-vary, then it's reflection of an underlying single dimension. Now, obviously, those questions are slightly different. 
Now, but they're, they'll relate to one another stably. And so you can infer out the central stable factors. Now, it might be the case that, so here's, a, here's an example. Because you might ask how many stable underlying dimensions are there in any set of questions. If I ask you questions that relate to your capacity to manipulate abstractions, I'll find that there's one factor. So imagine you had an infinite library of problem-solving questions. Doesn't matter what they are. Capital of Georgia. Um, here's a sequence. Two, four, six, eight, ten. What's the next number? Here's five patterns. Here's, and, and they, they transform uh, predictably across the pattern array. Here's five alternatives that the next pattern might be. Pick that one. Um, here, here's ten words. Tell me what they mean. Anything like that. Here's a mathematical operation. Compute it. Anything like that. Imagine you had a very large library of questions like that. Okay, an infinite library, and you took random sets of a hundred questions from that library, and you gave that, those sets to a thousand people. What you'd find was that people who, and, and the score, say you, you gave them a hundred questions, and then you summed across all the items to see how well they did. What you'd find was that people who did very well on one set of items would do very well on another set of items, and very well on another set of items. And that would be the same for people who did badly. If they did badly on any one of the sets of randomly chosen items of abstraction, they'd do badly on the rest. That's basically IQ. That's all there is to it. So it, it, what IQ does is correct that for age. But other than that, that's all there is to it. And the thing that's interesting about those random sets of abstract problem-solving questions is there's one dimension. That's it. Intelligence has one dimension. And it's, it's one of the most terrifying statistics that are known to social scientists. And IQ is a, an extraordinarily powerful predictor of long-term success, especially in complex jobs. And the reason for that, it's quite straightforward. Most complex jobs throw random sets of complex problems at you. That's, what, that's, that's their definition. So, for example, if you're working as a lawyer on complex, on complex court cases, you have to be able to read very quickly, you have to be able to abstract, you have to be able to problem solve, you have to be able to formulate arguments, and you have to do that repeatedly in different ways across very large spans of time. And so the, pr the fact that your ability to solve any set of random problems is a really good predictor of your ability to solve any set of random legal problems, it's more or less self-evident that that would be the case. But the, but the thing is, the thing that makes IQ so damn powerful, and, and it's one of the personality traits, roughly speaking, the thing that makes IQ so powerful is you can basically get a decent measure of it in 20 minutes. It's very terrifying. Anyways, we'll go into IQ in some depths as we progress through the course. But you get one dimension out of, out of a factor analysis of IQ. Now, in the personality domain, using descriptive items, you don't. You get five dimensions. And so, so and, you, you, and what are these dimensions exactly? Well, you could think about them as, I think of them as sub-personalities. So we learned from Dr. John Peterson that one application of factor analysis is with respect to the Big Five model. Yeah? The Big Five theory, or the Big Five model, gives you basically a model that gives you, that explains variation in human personality on five dimensions. That's why it's called the Big Five model. So one dimension that Dr. John Peterson was talking about is the dimension of agreeableness. Yeah? So you can be either low in agreeableness or high in agreeableness. Yeah? So people who are very, very, very high in agreeableness are people basically who never say no. Yeah? You probably know someone among your friends, you know, people who basically, they have usually no own opinion or so, they basically agree on anything. Yeah? I'm, obviously, I'm a little bit exaggerating here. Okay? So people low in agreeableness, yeah? they have very strong opinions, yeah? they there are people who, who are, are, are difficult to get along with, I would say. Yeah? So men are typically slightly, somewhat uh, lower in agreeableness as opposed to women. And those men who are very, very low in agreeableness, well, uh, many of them, obviously, they end up in jail. Another dimension is obviously uh, extraversion yeah? uh, as opposed as introversion, so if you are uh, low in extraversion, which means that you are an introvert, yeah, which is nothing bad by the way, people con confuse the people some, sometimes 
they, they uh, think of it as, as, as something bad, but it's, but it's not. So introvert people, they, uh, they are rather for, them, for themselves, yeah? they, they enjoy the nature and so on, and they find uh, a human interaction uh, more taxing, let's say. That. So they need somewhat to recover if they have a lot of uh, social interactions. Whereas people who are extrovert, people who score or who load high on that factor here, who are uh, extrovert, these are people who find it energizing to be uh, among others. Okay? So the third dimension here is openness. Well, people who are very high in openness, uh, they are usually very creative and or intelligent whereas people who are score uh, low, who are loading low on openness, uh, well, you know, we just talked about machine learning people, okay? Just fun. Um, the fourth dimension here in our factor analysis is uh, the factor uh, which is called conscientiousness. Yeah? So people who are loading high on that factor, who are high in conscientiousness, these are people who obviously who uh, work work a lot, they enjoy working, yeah? whereas, and also they obviously have, uh, have uh, they, are, they keep things in order, right? So people that are very low in conscientiousness, yeah, these are people who are obviously um, who go with the flow, more or less, I would say. Then we have the last dimension in this big five model, which is the factor called, uh, or denoted as neuroticism, so people who score or who load high on, on, on that factor here, they basically, they get uh, very easily scared of, of anything. Yeah? They people, there's a people who basically respond to the noise and not the signal, okay? Or they respond to both actually, the noise and the signal. Whereas people who are loading low on neuroticism, uh, these are people who are calm and relaxed, I would say, and uh, they res respond rather to the signal uh, than the noise. Now let's take this example uh, away. As another example uh, from financial economics, which is obviously my field of research, uh, let's consider the stock market, uh, where we have, for instance, in the US, we have about 4,000 stocks, uh, and people try to figure out or what, what, what people think about or what they are doing, or what they are interested in research-wise is, okay, can we break down the universe of stocks uh, into the, the, the uh, key drivers? What are the key drivers of stock returns? Uh, so, and there's, there's, a, there's a huge field of research which is uh, referred to as asset pricing, yeah, where we have two parts. We can divide into empirical asset pricing and theoretical asset pricing. pricing. And what, what we do in, in asset pricing is that we try to figure out what are these risk factors. Yeah? What are the factors that span the universe of, of, of thousands of stocks? Can we somehow reduce the dimension of that, uh, of the asset space? Yeah? So there are very, uh, 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 there's a lot of research done and uh, in 2013 or 2014, 2013, you know, Pharma, uh, Eugene Pharma got the Nobel Prize yeah, for his research that is exactly related to this field of, of science yeah? for his uh, asset pricing model, the three-factor asset pricing model. So let's get uh, started with our lecture, with our main lecture. And uh, before we uh, begin, we need to be on the same page. Yeah? So as a background, yeah, let's just take this away. So what we will talk about in this lecture, as, as we spoke about earlier, we are, talking, we are talking about the sports car. So we are talking about principle, principle component analysis. often abbreviated as PCA, uh, Principal Component Analysis. So this is the focus of our lecture today. But as a background, yeah, we need to start somewhere. 
So as a background, we need to go back to the high school, yeah, to matrix calculus or matrix algebra. So what we know is, if we have a matrix, yeah, let's say we have a, a three by three matrix, three by three, yeah, let's call it A11, A12, A13, a21, a23, a21, a22, a23, and here in the last row we have a31, a32, and a33. So this is the matrix A, yeah, and it's a 3x3 three three matrix. Let us assume that this matrix A yeah, has full rank, which means this matrix is regular. It means uh, the rank of that matrix, the rank of A, is 3. And in the more general case, obviously, yeah, if we have an n by n matrix, yeah, a symmetric mat matrix, the rank of that matrix, if it's, if it's a full rank, and if the matrix is regular, then the rank of such matrix is n. So in this case, we operate with the dimension of 3. So this matrix, in case if it's regular, it means because we have, th we have 3, uh, because the dimension or the, the, the rank is 3, it means we have 3 eigenvalues, yeah? lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3, and we have corresponding eigenvectors. Yeah. Mu1, Mu2, and Mu3. So the eigenvectors, because the rank is 3 of our matrix A, so the corresponding eigenvectors are 3 by 1 vectors. So mu is a, is a 3 by 1 vectors with yeah, so just 3 numbers, 3 entries here. Yeah? It's 3 by 1. And the same is true for all the other eigenvectors. That is, they are 3 by 1. And obviously, yeah, so they, they have just numbers yeah, within, and these eigenvalues here, so lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3, they are element R. They can be any number. And if I'm not mistaken, they can even be in the complex domain. So this is what we need to know. Yeah, as a background knowledge, so any matrix, especially a matrix that is symmetric, yeah, that has full rank, yeah, has three matrix-specific eigenvalues, yeah, and these eigenvalues are some numbers yeah, that are element R, and for each specific eigenvalue, we have a specific eigenvector. Yeah. This is what we need to know. And now the uh, question arises, what is an eigenvalue and what is an eigenvector? Yeah? So the expression eigen or eigenvector in English is eigenvector also in German. So the original expression comes actually from German and, and was adopted into English because somehow, somewhat, uh, the people didn't know how to translate that. So that's, there are different words from different languages that are somewhat difficult to, to uh, translate. For instance, in Sweden, in Sweden we have lagum, lagum. What does that mean? So it's basically, if you would describe it as something that is not too much, but not, but not too little either. Yeah? It's, it's lagum. And uh, it's uh, difficult to translate this, obviously, in other languages they don't have the word for it, and, you know, but people understand what it means. Same with eigenvectors. An eigenvector, eigen actually in English means own. Yeah? For instance, if you, if you, if you would say, uh, I go my own way, in Germany you would say, ich gehe meinen eigenen Weg. Own, eigen, eigener. 
So eigenvector or eigenvalue means actually the, the, the own value of that matrix. Yeah? It's a specific uh, matrix specific value, the own value of that matrix and the own vector of that matrix. Yeah? And as we have three dimensions, we have also three corresponding eigenvectors and three corresponding eigenvalues. Yeah? So uh, how we calculate this, we will, we will talk about in a while. But this is the background knowledge that we need in order to understand what's going on. So let us start with three stochastic processes. Yeah? Let us denote the first process as x1t. And x1t is defined by a constant, let's denote it as alpha1, plus an error term, plus epsilon1t. Yeah? And x1t, basically if we in, in vector language or in, in, in matrix uh, calculus, this would be a vector, yeah, a t by one vector, if we have a time dimension, which has basically a vector that has capital T entries. Yeah? It's a t by one vector. Yeah? Then we have another, pro another process, let's call it x2 t. Yeah? It's a second process. And we have in deterministic term alpha 2 plus a stochastic term epsilon 2 t. Yeah? And a third one we have x3 t and it's defined by the de deterministic element alpha 3 plus the stochastic part epsilon 3 t. Yeah? So and what we could do is we could basically all of these three guys here are t by, t by one vectors. Uh, if we stack them into a matrix, what we would get obviously would be a capital T by three matrix. Yeah, this would be a matrix that has uh, obviously then uh, three vectors of length t by one stacked uh, next to each other into this matrix. Yeah? This is what we could do. So these three processes, x1, x2, x3, they can be partially correlated. Yeah? So what is important now to bear in mind, so we have, to, we have to make some assumptions here. So let's make the, let's make the assumption that all of these three processes, yeah, if this is the time dimension, and here we have uh, x1, x2, and x3. So let's assume that these processes, yeah, that they are circulating around some, some mean. Yeah? So what we do not want to have is a process that uh, would have this evolution here. Yeah? like a random walk. Yeah? We, we, we want to have a process that is well-behaving. Yeah? 
uh, that is circulating around uh, some mean value. And obviously, there are many different uh, ways you know, how to, how to uh, model a principal component analysis. So this is a very simple model. It's proper, probably the, the simplest model that you can think about. Yeah? And the assumption that we do is, okay, we have a stochastic process that is somewhat well-behaving. Yeah? So now the question arises, Mm. Is there any stochastic process that drives all of these three processes here simultaneously? Yeah? So, as I said earlier, these three processes here uh, can be correlated. Yeah? So, what principal component analysis is now doing, so the idea is we break down this system of correlated or potentially correlated processes, we break it down into a representation of three processes that are orthogonal. So that's the main idea of principal component analysis. So what we do is, okay, we say, okay, let's represent this equation here, x1, by, it, by, this, by the following equation, x1t is gamma1 plus beta11 s1t plus beta12 times s2t plus beta 1, 3 times S, 3, T, plus an error term, let's call it E, 1, T. Yeah? We can here also make the commas to make it more clear what's going on. So the second process, X, 2, T, we want to have a representation of X, 2, T is equal with gamma 2 plus beta 2 1 times s 2 t plus beta 2 2 times s 2 t plus beta 2 3 times s 3 t and we add also here an error term e 2 t. Yeah? And the final, the last process we want to represent uh, as follows. X3t is equal with obviously gamma 3 uh, plus beta 3 1 times, here we have a little mistake, it's an S1, times S1t plus beta 3 2 times S2 2, 3 plus beta 3, 3 times S3, T. And again, we have an error term, epsilon T, epsilon E3, T. Okay, epsilon we have already here, so it's E3, T. Yeah? So this is what principal component analysis is doing. So, and again, here, in this case, we have the covariance of x1 t and x2 t is probably unequal to zero. The covariance between x1 t and x3 t is unequal to zero or potentially unequal to zero. And the covariance between x2 t and x 3t is potentially also unequal to zero. But here, on the left-hand side, what principal component analysis is doing, we find a representation of these three processes here that is a linear combination of processes X, uh, S1, S2, and S3. Yeah? You see, 
that on the right hand side the stochastic variable s1 enters every equation. Likewise, the stochastic variable s2 it enters every equation here, but the loading is different, the beta loading is different, or maybe different. And we have also a third component denoted as S, S3. Yeah, S3, you see, it enters every equation here, but the beta loading is different. Yeah? It's beta 1, 3 in the first equation, beta 2, 3 in the second equation, and beta 3, 3 in the third equation. So the difference is that while the x variables may be correlated, if we run principal component analysis, these vectors here, yeah, the, the covariance between S1t and S2t is zero by construction. Likewise, the covariance between S1t and S3t is zero by construction. And finally, the covariance between S2t and S3t is zero by construction. Yeah? And obviously what we know already from statistics yeah, that the covariance between uh, S2t and S3t is the same as the covariance between S3t and S2t. So we don't need to write it down explicitly here. Yeah? It's implicit, implicitly given here. So that's the main idea of principal component analysis. Yeah? We break down a system that may be correlated yeah, into a system where we have components yeah, that consist of components that are by construction uncorrelated. Yeah? And moreover, obviously it's a linear combination of all of these three processes here. Yeah? So every process on the, on the left hand side is a linear combination of orthogonal factors and the orthogonal factors are S1t, S2t and S3t. Obviously, the dimension is the same as they. So, we, every, every vector here, said, we, we said earlier, has a dimension t by 1. The same is true for S1, S2 and S3. So, the, the, obviously, the dimension yeah, so of, of S, of the vector S1, is element matrix t by 1 which means it's a t by 1 vector. Yeah? The same is for S2 and for S3. S1, S2 and S3 are t by 1 vectors like X1, X2 and X3. So that's the first thing uh, that we have uh, to have in mind. So sometimes in, in mathematic books you will find this notation here. Yeah? So uh, S1 is orthogonal to, X, to S2, yeah? well, what it actually means is uh, that they are un uncorrelated. Yeah? It's a different expression how to write it. Yeah? Also, S2 is orthogonal, S3, and also uh, S1 uh, is orthogonal to S3. Yeah? It's obvious. So the, pro the processes S1, S2, and S3 are obviously not seen. Yeah? They are latent. They are in the data. And what we want to do is we want to extract them from the data. But before we uh, talk about how to calculate or how to compound these, uh, these uh, latent uh, factors, uh, S1, S2, S3, we have to talk about the question, uh, when does PCA actually make sense and when does it not make sense? In order to investigate this issue, let us distinguish two different cases, two extreme cases. So case one we assume that these processes here, our x1, x2, x3 are uncorrelated. Yeah? So the first case is uh, uncorrelated.
So how would the covariance matrix of our three variables look if they are completely uncorrelated? Well, that's pretty easy actually. The matrix would look like that. We have the sigma, sigma square from our x1 variable would be the first element on the main diagonal of the covariance matrix. The second element on the main diagonal would be the sigma square, which is the variance of our second variable, sigma square from x2. And the last element, the third element, would be the sigma square from our x3. Because they are uncorrelated, all elements above the main diagonal and below the main diagonal are equal to zero. Right? So remember, we have two processes, hence our covariance matrix has a dimension three by three. It's a three by three covariance matrix. So that's the case if they are uncorrelated. So and what is often done in the principal component analysis is that we standardize these processes here. Yeah? So how does that work out? So first of all, we take for x1 t, let's denote this standardized variable as x1 t as s for standardized. So the standardized variable is then simply calculated by x1t minus the mean minus x1 square uh, divided by the standard deviation of uh, our x1t uh, divided by sigma x1. Yeah? So that's basically the standard, the simple standardization of a random variable. Yeah? And what we usually learn in statistics that this uh, standardized random variable then is approximately, follows approximately a uh, normal distribution with the mean zero and variance one. Yeah? In real life, given that the variable is not normally distributed, uh, it still is true that by construction, this random variable would follow a distribution that has a zero mean and a standard deviation uh, from one, equal to one. Yeah? And given that, this, that the standard deviation is equal to one, the variance is one, two. Right? So, so this operation here yeah, can be done, of course, for all the other variables as well, for x2 and x3t in the same manner. So for each point in time, yeah, we subtract the corresponding sample mean of each random variable and divide it by the standard deviation. Yeah? It's called normalization or standardization. We get a random variable that is distributed with zero mean and standard deviation of one. And what does that imply for the uh, covariance matrix? Well, if we first standardize our random variables and given they are uncorrelated, yeah, our variance covariance matrix, or simply covariance matrix, would be simply the identity matrix that is three by three. Yeah? Because obviously the variance or the uh, standard deviation and variance have a value of one. Yeah? It, it must be because on the main diagonal we collect the corresponding uh, vari uh, variances of each random variable. So it must be true that our um, covariance matrix is simply the identity matrix. Yeah? Very simple. So in this case, because the processes are completely uncorrelated, what does that mean for our eigenvalues or our eigenvectors? So if we have standardized our series, our, our, our data vectors, yeah, what we know is that the sum of eigenvalues is three. Uh, so the sum of our eigenvalues, so the sum of lambda i 
and i in our case is from 1 to 3 yeah, is 3. In the more general case, yeah, if we have n different time series or n data vectors, then obviously, and we standardize our data vectors, then our uh, standard, or the covariance matrix of our standardized data vectors, the sum of the eigenvalues would be n. Uh, in our simple case, it's 1. So, and if they are completely uncorrelated, yeah, what does that mean? So it means that each process explains only itself. Yeah? So there is no common factor that drives all of them together. Yeah? So because they are uncorrelated, they are orthogonal. So what that means is that in this case, if they are uncorrelated, it means that our lambda 1 is equal to 1, our lambda 2 is equal to 1, and our lambda 3 is also equal to 1. They all have the same economic magnitude. It must be like that. Yeah? What else can we say? So, we can say that the first eigenvalue explains one-third of the overall variation yeah, in these data vectors here. Yeah? So it, it means that in, in this case, so the, the, the first eigenvalue explains the economic magnitude is 1 over 3. Yeah? The same is for the second one. It's 1 over 3 and the third one as well. Yeah? Each of them explains one-third of the overall variation. And in the more general case, it's 1 over n. Or let's write it as lambda i over n. Yeah? The general case. So that's the first extreme case, uh, given that they are completely uncorrelated. So let's now consider the second case where we allow for an extreme correlation. Again, we have three random variables. Yeah. We do our standardization, which is common practice in principal component analysis, yeah. because obviously our eigenvectors and our eigenvalues are very easy to interpret, as we have seen, right? So let's now assume they are, that uh, in our second case, that our data series, our data vectors, yeah, I need, we need a new pen here, obviously. Let's assume almost almost perfectly almost perfect correlation we have the case of almost perfect correlation yeah it should not be perfectly correlated because otherwise obviously we couldn't do this transformation here right so now they are almost perfectly Correlate. What does that imply for the covariance matrix? How would it look like? Again, we do our, our standardization. Yeah? And what we would have is obviously that our covariance matrix would, like, would look like this. Yeah? On the main diagonal, we have once again, because by definition, the variance after standard, standardization is equal with the standard with, is equal with the standard deviation which is one yeah so on the main diagonal of the covariance matrix we have once again but above and below the main diagonal all entries are 0 0.99 yeah? why is that the case so obviously if we use the standardization the covariance and the correlation is the same because the correlation is nothing else but the covariance 
of two variables divided by the standard deviation of the first variable times the standard deviation of the second variable. Yeah? Given that the standard deviation is 1 and 1, yeah, we see yeah, that, our, that the correlation breaks down uh, to the co covariance. Yeah? So, again, almost perfect correlation implies that the covariance matrix looks like that. So, how would our eigenvalues look like? Yeah? So, if this is the case, yeah, if the correlation between these three data series is almost, almost perfect, in this case, there is obviously then one factor that drives all of these three data series. Yeah? So, there is one dominant eigenvalue. So, this eigenvalue here, so the maximum magnitude is of course 3, yeah? like in the previous case. But now the uh, economic magnitude of 3 is now distributed differently ac across these eigenvectors, so uh, across these eigenvalues. Okay? So the first eigenvalue, lambda 1, would be something like, just get another pen here. So the, the first eigenvalue, lambda 1, which is the largest eigenvalue, which is the dominant eigenvalue, it would be close to 2 point, let's say 2.99. Yeah, it's almost 3. So the second one, the lambda, two, the lambda 2, this eigenvalue would be close to 0. Yeah, it would be something like 0 0.005 or something. And the same is for the third one. The third eigenvalue or the third, actually we have to say the third standardized eigenvalue, yeah? because we are considering here the standardized data series. Yeah? So we should add here a, an S just to make sure that we don't confuse it with the uh, eigenvalues of the original data series. Okay? So the uh, third eigenvalue would be also have, would have a magnitude close to zero or something like 0 0.005. Yeah? So what does that mean? So it means that there is one, one eigenvector or, or one stochastic process that explains almost the whole variation of these three data vectors here. Yeah? So the, exponent, the exponentiary power yeah, of the first eigenvalue would be 2.99 over 3. Yeah? It's something like, yeah, it's zero, it's 99.9%, something like that. Whereas the exponentiary power, or let's say uh, the third, the second and the third standardized eigenvalue, they explain close to 0% of the va variation, uh, of the current variation in these systems of vectors. Yeah, this would be how we would interpret uh, this finding here. In real life, however, we, not, we, we don't have uh, uh, either of these cases. You know, we, we don't observe almost perfect correlation and because obviously given that we are in, in finance, uh, we would observe if this would be, if, if we would have perfect correlation, this would imply that two stocks have exactly the, the same return paths, yeah? which would imply that this, these are the same companies. So obviously this, this doesn't make sense. And uh, also uh, usually uh, what we see is a high, a high uh, order of, of, of correlation. Yeah? For instance, if we consider, uh, just to name an example, if we consider uh, new digital financial markets, such as cryptocurrency markets, they have a very, very high correlation. The correlation is much higher than in among stocks. Yeah? So these are the two, two extreme cases. So in, uh, in real life, we have something in between. Yeah? So in, in, in real life, it could be that uh, the uh, dominant eigenvalue, uh, if you would have a similar system, that the dominant eigenvalue has a value maybe of 2.5, 
yeah, or something between 2 and 2.5 and these are accordingly between 0 0.5 and 0 0.75 or something like that. Now this is what we would observe in, in real life. So and now we have to remember what we were talking about uh, in the beginning of our session. Yeah. So we have to remember that every corresponding uh, eigenvalue, yeah, so lambda 1 has a corresponding eigenvector mu 1, yeah, second eigenvalue has also a corresponding eigenvector mu 2 and the third one as well. Yeah? So lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, these are numbers. Uh, it could be, I don't know, as we have, as we have just said, it could be 2.99, 0 0.005, 0 0.005, or 1, 1, 1, whatever. And these uh, mu, these are vectors. Yeah? If we have a system of three, uh, three uh, data vectors, these are obviously, this must be, by definition, uh, three by one vectors. Yeah? Or more in, in the more general case, n by 1 vectors. So what is now, uh, what is principal component analysis now doing? So we basically, um, we get this process here. Yeah? Now we want to, well, we, we want to get the, 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 we want to break down our data vectors into three orthogonal processes, S1, S2, S3. Yeah? In, the, in, the, in the second case, for instance, that we just considered, where we had a almost perfect correlation, yeah? and given that our lambda 1 yeah, is the uh, dominant eigenvalue, which has a uh, number of 2.99, then obviously we are, in, we are only interested in the first eigenvector, yeah? in, in S1. This is the guy that is of, in this case, this is the guy that is actually of importance, yeah? in this case. So, how do we compound, how do we get this, this data vector, S1? So, S1, as we, tell, as we said in the beginning, must have the same dimension as all the other data vectors. It's a T by 1 vector. So, and principal component analysis does it now mechanically. So, what we can say is, we can calculate the T by 1 vector, S1, by multiplying the matrix x times the eigenvector mu 1. Yeah? Now remember, what is x? So our x is a matrix, yeah? it's a t by 3 matrix, where we stack the data vectors x1, x2, x3 into this matrix here. Yeah? So here in the first column, we have our x1, data vector x1, which is t by 1, in the, the second column is our data vector x2, and in the last column we have our data vector x3. Yeah? And again, we can of course easily expand it to a higher dimension. Yeah? In general, this matrix, this x matrix, would be then t by n, okay? or t by k, depending on how you define the uh, dimension. Yeah? So given that this matrix here is a, is a t by 3 matrix, yeah, it's a t by 3 matrix, and then given that this vector is a 3 by 1 vector, yeah, obviously what we get out is a t by 1 vector, yeah? exactly how it should be. Yeah? S1 should be a t by 1 vector. So what we have to do here, basically, is nothing else but we multiply our mu1, now this is our mu1, yeah? We, we, we multiply yeah, each row, yeah, here is the, is the row 1, yeah, t is 1, we multiply the uh, first element in our, the first element, the first elements in our x1, x2, x3 vector yeah, with our eigenvector. Yeah, yeah. This is what we do, scalar, we build the scalar product, yeah, which is just, just a number, and this would be then the first element. Yeah, of 
our data vector s. Yeah? Uh, we multiply this, put it there. And we do this for each row. Uh, next, we take the second row of our x matrix, yeah, which, which is the second observation of our uh, data vector x1, x2, x3, uh, and we multiply it with our eigenvector. So the eigenvector is obviously always the same yeah, in each iteration. This would be in the second observation, and so on. So we do it until capital T. Uh, and then, by this, we have constructed the uh, corresponding time series of the first principal component. Yeah? So this is, the first, this is the time series of the first principal component, S1, uh, which enters in our representation every e uh, each equation. Yeah? And this is obviously this guy here alone, considering again the case uh, of that our lambda 1 is something like 2.99. So this guy alone would explain 99% yeah, of the overall uh, variation in this system here. Yeah? So we can basically neglect this part uh, in this case. So we do not need the second and the third uh, eigenvector yeah? because we know already that the, uh, that the first eigenvector yeah, is S1. Yeah? Basically, this part here explains all these three uh, data vectors. Yeah? The only thing that differs is, is obviously the, uh, the, the loading, yeah? the sensitivity, the exposure against these principal component series that we compounded. Yeah? So what would, this is the one case. So now let's go back to the first case. Let us now assume that our lambda is 1 uh, and the second lambda is also 1 and the third lambda is also 1. Yeah? This is the case of uncorrelation, yeah? that, our uh, that our three processes are completely uncorrelated. Yeah? What would be our eigenvectors? So obviously, our eigenvectors would exactly be the same like our original processes, right? This is what comes out. Because if lambda is 1, yeah, what, what one can show is that one eigenvector is 1, 0, 0, yeah, which is our mu 1. The second eigenvector would be 0, 1, 0. This would be our mu 2. And the third eigenvector would be 0, 0, 1. This would be our mu 3. Yeah? So if this guy here, our mu 1, is 1, 0, 0, what does that mean? Yeah? So it, it means we multiply if you, if you multiply the first row with this guy, because the second and the third entry is zero, what we get is just, again, the first entry here, which is the first observation of our x1 vector. Yeah? And this would be then the first element in our s1 vector as well. Yeah? And we would do this for each point in time. Yeah? We would always grab, basically, uh, only the element of our x1 vector. So now we have shown that in case of uncorrelation, the S1 coincides with, with, with the uh, original data vector x, x1, whereas the second one would be the same like our x2, and the third one obviously would be the same with our x3 in standardized terms. Okay? So this is basically uh, what comes out if we run uh, principal uh, component analysis. So again, just to name it again, so the difference is obviously if these three processes, if they are already orthogonal or close to orthogonal, 
we don't need principal component analysis because the purpose of principal component analysis is to, to give a representation yeah, of our or original data vectors in terms of orthogonal, of uncorrelated yeah, processes. And these uncorrelated processes are constructed by using the corresponding eigenvectors. Okay? But if they are uncorrelated or close to be uncorrelated, these two guys coincide. They are the same thing. Whereas if they are highly correlated, obviously this makes sense because we can reduce the dimension yeah, from, from 3 to 1. That's the purpose of principal component analysis. So, and now the question arises, okay, how do we compound the eigenvectors or the eigenvalues of a matrix? So let's uh, take this away. So every matrix, we talked about this uh, issue in the beginning when we, when we were talking about the, the background in linear algebra. So every matrix or let's uh, take the red, the, the red pen here. So every matrix Let's denote this matrix as C, C for covariance. So let's, we have here C11, C12, C13, we have C21, C22, C23, and here we have C31, C32, and C33. So it's a 3 by 3 matrix again. Yeah? In the more general case, this would be an n by n, so we can obviously everything, all what we do, you can easily expand it to high dimension. Yeah? We just want to keep things simple here. So that's the matrix C. Yeah? So we get the eigenvectors by solving a specific uh, eigenvalue problem. Yeah? So the eigenvalue problem is given by, yeah, you, you have a matrix C, you multiply it with an eigenvector, and here it's, let's call it mu i, and i can be 1, 2, or 3, and this should be equal yeah, with the corresponding lambda i, which is the eigenvalue, the corresponding eigenvalue times the vector, the eigenvector mu i. So that's the equation that we need to solve. So, and in more general terms, so that's a 3 by 3 matrix. Our mu i, we have mu i1 here, element mu i1, mu i2, and mu i3. So this is the corresponding element, yeah? These are the corresponding elements for our 3 by 1 vector, which is the corresponding eigenvector mu i yeah, for eigenvalue i. And this should be equal with lambda i, which is just a scalar, it's just a number, a figure, times the same vector, yeah, the same corresponding eigenvector mu i1, mu i2, and finally mu i3. Yeah? And now obviously uh, these are numbers. Yeah? That's a 3 by 1 vector, 3 by 1 vector. And if you multiply a scalar, this is 1 by 1, it's just a number, yeah? so it's 1 by 1. If you multiply a scalar with a vector, it's obviously, you know, it's all, it has the same dimension, it's the dimension remains, so it's 3 by 1. And this guy here, if you multiply a 3 by 3 matrix, with a 3 by 1 vector, what we get is obviously a 3 by 1. Yeah. Uh, 
which must be true because we have here this equal sign. So, and obviously there are three different lambda i's and eigenvectors, corresponding eigenvectors, mu i's, yeah, that can solve this specific characteristic equation. Yeah. So, and every matrix that has full rank, yeah, or every regular matrix, yeah, with, if the rank of this matrix, the rank of C, the rank of C, and we have, let's say, n data vectors, if the rank of C is n, in our case it's, it's 3, then it follows that we have three corresponding eigenvalues and three corresponding uh, eigenvectors that can solve this equation. So, and how to do that? So that's a thing where we uh, need to open a math book. Uh, when I was a student uh, at the University of Kiel in Germany, obviously I learned to do this by hand, so I can solve this equation. Yeah. And, uh, but luckily we don't have to do it because it's obviously uh, it's, it's, it's quite complicated, I, I would like to say. And uh, so we don't, nowadays we don't need to do this anymore, yeah, but we have to understand what's behind that, okay? So, um, and nowadays we can just use it in a program, yeah? So we can use it, well, what we will do it, we'll implement this in a program called MATLAB, uh, and, and, and another program called eViews, yeah, which are standard programs nowadays uh, used in, in finance, uh, economics, physics, and actually any kind of natural science as well. So, what we can also do is now, so we can do, we, let's, let, let's take this away, So we start, if we do principal, principal component analysis, we usually start, which is common practice, with the standardized series. So if we now know that in the standardized series there is one dominant eigen, eigenvalue, yeah, and then we are obviously interested in this guy. So knowing that there is one, one driving force in our uh, system of data vectors, we can now go back and do the same thing for the original uh, for, the, for the original data vectors. Yeah? So we can do uh, we can solve this eigenvalue this, the eigenvalue problem, yeah? and we can sort the, the eigenvalues in the in the increasing order. Yeah? We remember the the position where is the eigenvector, eigenvector located in MATLAB. It, it sorts from from in an increasing order. So the last one is the uh, largest eigenvalue then we know, okay, uh, in the matrix of eigenvectors, yeah, we have to grab the, uh, the last eigenvector, yeah, because this corresponds to the, to the uh, eigenvalue that has the largest economic magnitude, and then we grab this guy and we multiply the uh, original data vectors with that guy, and then we would get the corresponding uh, eigen, uh, principal component series S1 yeah, uh, for that guy but for the, uh, for the original data series, yeah? because often we are interested in the original data series, right? So this is what we would also do uh, when we do our, our MATLAB exercise. Yeah? So what's now the problem with principal component analysis and factor analysis? And now let's uh, Listen to what Nassim Taleb, the uh, author of the best-selling book, The Black Swan, uh, is, telling you, is telling you about that. Let's talk about something else that goes out the window. So here what goes out the window is a lot of econometrics that deals with squares. Okay, anything that has squares in it. Squares or higher powers, just take it and again, because it's useless, all right? And this explains why they can't forecast what's going on, because you use the wrong method, okay? In sample it will work, but out of sample it won't work. If I say variance is infinite, 
you're not going to observe anything infinite in sample. <laughs> but it means as you keep having data, it will get different values all the time. You see? So that's what, what, what it means. Even if the mean is finite, if it takes so much to know about it, you, you can't deal with it. Okay? It's, it's not something workable. Anyway, so uh, this is PCA, Principal Component Analysis. Principal component analysis works beautifully with thin tails, dimension reduction for big data. But the problem is, you know that there is noise. If I, my, I don't have enough data, I have an illusion of a structure, but as I increase my data, my n variables, it becomes flat. And if, this is data that has absolutely no structure. In other words, an expectation, you have a zero correlation on that matrix, okay? But for those familiar with uh, uh, random matrix theory, Marchenko Pasteur, you have um, some kind of errors on, on observation, okay, that makes you think there's a higher correlation and that washes out as you increase n. So to summarize for those not into PCA's principal component analysis, as I have spurious correlation, I get more data here, but then this washes out as I increase the sample size and non spurious stays. For fat tails, look what I got. <laughs> Okay, and it doesn't wash out when I add data. You need to add a lot more data for it to wash out. So that's dimension reduction doesn't work well with fat tails. Actually, it doesn't work with fat tails. Okay, there are other techniques on that later. So what did we learn from Nassim Taleb? So he said that in order to do principal component analysis, we have to we should have data vectors that have thin tails, as as opposed to fat tails. So what's the difference between thin tails and fat tails? So now we have to remember what we know from statistics classes. So we know there are at least four central moments that any distribution has. So we have the first moment. So if you can now consider the data vector x1, for instance, so we have the, the, uh, the, 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 the mean, which is the first moment. The second moment is the variance. The third moment is the skewness. The fourth moment is the kurtosis. So the, the thing with fat tails is that um, some classes of distributions, they do not have a kurtosis. Uh, they don't have a kurtosis or a sample specific kurtosis, uh, a kurtosis that is not stable. So what we know from, from thin tail distribution, for instance, the normal distribution, uh, the normal distribution is an example of a, th of a thin tailed distribution. Yeah? So the kurtosis of the normal distribution is 3. Yeah? The kurtosis is 3. Fat tailed distributions are, for instance, a t distribution. If you consider a t distribution with uh, 5 degrees of freedom, this is much fatter tailed. Yeah? than the normal distribution. So the kurtosis is larger than 3. Yeah? So the thing is that the kurtosis, the, the kurtosis must be finite so that the variance of the distribution is, is not sample specific. If the, if the kurtosis is infinite, means that the variance of the data series is sample specific, yeah? which means the covariance matrix is also sample specific. Every sample you get a different variance or a covariance matrix. So your principal components do not tell you much. Yeah? So that's the problem that we often see in research. Especially in financial markets, uh, we are dealing with kurtosis that is typically larger than 3, yeah, unless you are working with uh, annual data or quarterly data. But if you work with more higher frequented data, such as daily data or monthly data, usually the, the kurtosis of stock returns uh, is larger than 3. And uh, depending on the distribution, on the uh, underlying distribution, uh, if the distribution has an infinite uh, kurtosis means the, the standard deviation or respectively the uh, variance uh, is sample specific 
and all, all of our results are yeah, valid for the sample. Let us now see how to implement principal component analysis in a standard program such as MATLAB. Here I have al already opened the program. This is how it looks like. Here we have on the right hand side the command window. Here on the left hand side is the workspace. So everything that we do, every vector that we create or any matrix that, that we create here is stored here in the workspace. As an example, I have chosen uh, a data matrix uh, that has uh, vectors of zero cost trading strategies. Yeah. So it's an example from financial economics since my background is in financial economics as well. So we have here in this data matrix, uh, it's an Excel file, we have uh, in the first column uh, the asset turnover, second column we have the gross margin, third column the return on equity, on, on book equity, uh, here we have in the fourth column the return on assets, and here in the last column, the fifth column, we have the um, unexpected earning surprises. Yeah. So our data sample is from July 1973 until, you see, December 2013, covering 486 months. Now we can also plot our time series, yeah, let's plot all of them from, uh, we can choose insert and then go here on, on the insert line or area of, and this is basically this is not right, once again. Insert here, and here we go. So that's basically then uh, the uh, time series. So once again, something went wrong here. Let us uh, mark all of them, and we go on insert, line, and this is what we get. Yeah. So this is basically the, the time series evolution of the returns of our different strategies here. Now this is how it looks like. Uh, so they are overlapping quite a lot. You see, we see periods where the volatility is very high in the beginning of the sample and also here towards the end of the sample. And we have also periods where the volatility across all strategies appears to be very low. Uh, so that's uh, these uh, zero cost uh, strategies are basically, uh, they are long on a certain subset of stocks and short on a certain subset of other stocks. Yeah? So it's zero cost strategy, which means these uh, portfolios, all of them are self uh, financing. Yeah, so let us now uh, open our MATLAB. Again, let us import the data file. I have it here in my folder PCA, data earnings rated anomalies. Let's upload the matrix. Uh, we click here on matrix and we don't need the first column because this is just the uh, time span. We upload, we did push the OK button here and now the matrix is uploaded into the workspace, which we see here. It's a 586 times 5 matrix. So now we have five, 486 time series observations and 5 different strategies. Let's rename the matrix simply as X. Yeah. First of all, before we get started, let us take an example that we also discussed throughout the lectures in the beginning. Let us code an identity matrix. Yeah. The syntax is I. And it, let us code an identity matrix that has a dimension 3. Yeah. So this, this now our, our correlate, correlation matrix is now this one here, or our covariance matrix because we assume that the time series are standardized. Yeah? This is, again, this is just an example. This has nothing to do with our X matrix here. Yeah? This is exactly what we discussed in the beginning of the lecture. If all of our strategies would be uncorrelated and standardized, okay, then the covariance matrix would look like this. Now, it would be simply an identity matrix. If we now want to retrieve the uh, eigenvectors and the eigenvalues, of this data matrix here, yeah, we, we discussed what we have to do is we have to solve an eigenvector problem and uh, we don't have to do it obviously by, by hands, MATLAB can do that and the syntax is 
we write v d and then this parenthesis here yeah and i which means eigen and then we plug in this matrix here that we just created and what matlab then spits out is in on the matrix d yeah it's a three by three matrix and it will give us the corresponding eigenvalues on the main diagonal in an increasing order. The matrix V will contain the corresponding eigenvectors. Yeah? So, because obviously it sorts the eigenvalues in increasing order, the last column in the matrix V will give us the corresponding eigenvector that corresponds to the largest or the dominant eigenvalue of d. Now let's do it here. So you see it's the same obviously because we spoke about it also in, in the lectures. So this is an eigenvalue here and we just have to consider what is on the main diagonal of d. So the largest eigenvalue is 1. So all of them are 1. So our lambda 1 is 1, lambda 2 is 1, lambda 3 is 1 exactly like we discussed on the whiteboard. So what's the corresponding eigenvector for the, the corresponding eigenvector for this eigenvalue you will find here in the third column. Yeah? So that's our S1. That's our S2. And this is here our S3. So this is exactly what we have been discussing in the lecture. Let us now code another matrix. Let us code a matrix uh, C1, which is a different covariance matrix. And we discussed this example as well in the lecture. Yeah, these two extreme cases, uncorrelated. Yeah, in this case, obviously, we see it doesn't make much of a sense to perform principal component analysis because obviously what we, if we would multiply the, or, the original data matrix or the standardized matrix with this eigenvector here, it would give us the uh, third column of our uh, data matrix uh, so, and this would give us, if you multiply each row in our data matrix with this guy here, transposed of course, then what we would get is then obviously the second element of our data matrix. And here we would get simply the first vector of our data matrix. So, obviously it would not make much of a sense. Now we can just leave the, uh, the data matrix as it is. We don't need to perform principal component analysis. So, let's now code a data matrix. Um, it, that has a very high correlation. So we have one always on the main diagonal because in the standardized case you remember the variance of a data series that is standardized is by construction one. And since we have standard series yeah, the covariance and the correlation is the same so we have 0 0.99 as the correlation and covariance. Yeah? So this is the first row we have 1, 0 0.99, 0 0.99. In the second row, we have 0 0.99, 1, and 0 0.99. And in the last row, we have 0 0.99, 0 0.99, and 1. Now let's close the matrix here, and let's also see what it is. So this is exactly what we discussed in the lecture as well, yeah? So we have again on the, on, the, on the main diagonal the corresponding variance or standard deviation which is one of the standardized time series and we have here the correlation. We assume now here, okay, that this time series, all of the three time series here are highly correlated. So again, let's get the eigenvectors and the corresponding eigenvalues. So we, we code again, we give the syntax as, as above and uh, give the command i now we have the, the covariance matrix c1 and let's spit it out yeah so we see exactly what we have discussed in the lecture so we have now here the eigenvalues yeah the uh, smallest eigenvalues they are close to one yeah and matlab rounds it uh, until four figures after the uh, uh, the dot here so the largest eigenvalue is almost three yeah? and it's by construction here yeah so the largest eigenvalue is two point 98 and the corresponding the corresponding eigenvector we see here in the third column of v yeah. the second column obviously has the corresponding is the corresponding eigenvector to this eigenvalue here yeah the second one 
on the main diagonal and the first is obviously here, which is the corresponding eigenvector for this eigenvalue of 0.01, which is the first one on this main diagonal. Now, this is exactly what we discussed in the lecture, but let us now go to our real life data that we have already imported it here. Yeah, if we now uh, plot the first, the first vector in X, yeah, what we see is then the, the time series of the first uh, anomaly or the first trading strategy yeah, in our X matrix. We can also plot uh, the second one, which we see here. Yeah, this is the time series evolution of our second strategy, which is the gross margin, yeah, and so on and so forth. So what we do now is, so we have obviously, um, we can open here a new script. We could, we could also write everything here directly into the workspace, but I usually write it first in a script. So let's now say, okay, we have five anomalies. So let's denote it as uh, capital N is five. We have the time series dimension. So N denotes obviously the cross-sectional dimension. Yeah, and now the time series dimension is denoted by capital T. T is the length of our X matrix. Yeah. Then we let us now construct the standardized time series. Let's denote this matrix as capital S underscore S, S for standardized, and it should have the same dimension as our original matrix X. Yeah. So it has uh, zeros uh, of T and N. Yeah? And now remember, this is the standard approach, the common approach in principal component analysis. Yeah, first we uh, standardized it, the series so that they have a mean of zero and the standard deviation or variance of one. And then we run the eigenvalue problem. Yeah? So, uh, and, of, and of course, one can also do it for the uh, um, original data series, but obviously then it's much more tricky to interpret the uh, eigenvalues, yeah? because obviously the eigenvalues, as we discussed in the lecture, uh, tell us something about uh, what uh, the, the degree of explanation, yeah? the, explanatory, the explanatory power. So if the eigenvalue is close to, is close to three, you know, or in, 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 in our case, it was 2.98. So that, that means that this single eigenvalue explains us 2.98 over three, yeah, because in standardized series, the eigenvalues are always of uh, the, the, the sum of eigenvalues needs to be n. Uh, it needs to be n. So that's why we see here in this case this one single factor here, yeah, the linear combination. If we multiply the the uh, data vector with 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 this eigenvector here, yeah, so this time series would give us. 99.33% of the overall overall variation of uh, our three uh, data vectors. Yeah? If this is if this would be the covariance matrix of our data. Okay, so that's easy to interpret, uh, and so we see there's only one dominant factor that spans the overall uh, universe of, of of three data vectors. Yeah, so this is much more difficult to interpret if we do not uh, operate with standardized time series. That's the reason why we do that. So let's now, okay, let's now call, uh, code a for loop for j is one to n. So we do this for for the whole cross section. Yeah, first for the we start with the first column for the first um, trading strategy. Then we standardize the second one until we reach the last one, the fifth one. We have an inner for loop as well, and this covers the time series dimension. It goes from one to capital T. And what should we do? Okay, in each position of our standardized data matrix, yeah, because we have the time dimension and the cross-sectional dimension. And what do we put in there? Well, it should be the same element that we have in our original matrix, data matrix, which is x t comma j minus the mean of x, yeah, and now we have to do, we have to put in this, this colon here. Uh, we take the mean for the corresponding uh, first whole first column. If we operate, uh, if we want to allocate the corresponding standardized increment 
for the uh, first uh, column yeah because we start with the first column yeah and then obviously we subtract uh, from the first element in our x matrix yeah, the whole mean across the column yeah this is what we do if we want to standardize a time series so uh, what we do then is we have to put this into brackets here yeah so and then we have to divide it by the square root of the variance which is just the standard deviation yeah of the same yeah, of the first column yeah, very simple then we end this loop and we end also the outer loop yeah this is now what we do here obviously is the uh, stun let me just see if everything is correct here yeah this seems to be working And yeah, here was obviously a bracket missing. And MATLAB gave us actually, you see, if we have missed something, then MATLAB would give us here this, this red uh, line, and, it, and it, mean, it means there's a syntax error. So we ha I have forgotten here this bracket. So this is what we do. Yeah, this is how standardization works. Yeah? You have an element, you subtract the sample mean from, from that uh, increment and divide it by the standard deviation. Yeah? So, so what you get is a you, you get basically here then the corresponding standardized element. Now let's just run the code that we have so far, copy it and paste it into the workspace, uh, sorry, into the command window. Yeah, and now we can see our uh, X matrix. Let's plot the first vector of our standardized data matrix, yeah, which is the first column. And you see it's circulating around zero. Yeah. If you go now, if you now take the mean of, of that guy, let's take the mean of that. You see it's zero. And let's take the variance of that guy is one. Okay, so it's exactly what we should do. Yeah? It's now we have standardized the time series. And the same is true for the second guy. Yeah? If we now take the second column in our data matrix, it's the same, it's standardized. And we can also go here, we can make double click, and we see basically this, this is the time corresponding time series, yeah? and all of them have now zero mean and standard deviation or variance of one. And the same is for this. The same is true for all of them. Yeah? All of them have zero mean and standard deviation or a variance of one. So now we have the corresponding um, standardized data matrix. What we do now is, okay, we, let's, let's uh, construct the covariance matrix of the standardized data series, which is given by simply the, op the operator covariance of our X underscore S matrix. Yeah. Let's also copy this into the command window directly. So this is how the matrix looks like. Yeah, you see, of course, on the on the main diagonal again we have we have ones. Yeah, it must be like that by construction. And you see here already that some of the strategies are pretty much correlated. Yeah, you see a, a, a correlation of 0.52, on here a correlation of 0.91. So you see some of these strategies are obviously highly correlated, which already already tells you something. Yeah, you so obviously um, there might be some eigenvalues which are very large and others are very very low so let's now go go back here let's now give us the corresponding uh, eigenvectors of that co uh, of this covariance matrix it was the code this uh, the syntax was this parenthesis here and v comma d and then the eigen from our standardized covariance matrix. Yeah? Let's also copy this into the works uh, into the command window here, and this is what comes out. Yeah, you see here the uh, eigenvalues are increasing. So MATLAB gives us always um, the eigenvalues in an increasing order on the main diagonal of the matrix D. So the largest eigenvalue is 2.62, and all the others are below one. So which means quite clearly 
So we have only one dominant eigenvalue, which explains a whole bunch, uh, a, a large degree of the variation in our data series. So what, to what extent does this one uh, data series or this principal component related to this eigenvalue here, what's the ex explanatory power of that guy? So it's 2.62 to 3 over 5, yeah, because we have 5 strategies. So the sum of these eigenvalues must be 5. So it, ex it explains more than half of the variation of our 5 data vectors. Yeah, this is quite a lot. So what does that mean? So it means that our uh, five, that basically there's one dominant factor that drives our five training strategies into the same direction. Yeah? So there's one factor that, that forces the, the evolution of the time series in the same direction. So what do we want to do next? Yeah, what we also discussed in the, in the lectures, what is then this time series of, of the, the, the eigenvector? Now we have the eigenvalues, yeah, and we know that in the matrix, in the matrix V, we have the corresponding eigenvector. So the last one here, this guy here, we are interested in this guy obviously because this guy is related, is the corresponding eigenvector related to this eigenvalue. Yeah? It's the last one. It's the same order. It's in the same order. So we have to multiply this guy here, this five by one vector. Yeah? with every row of our data matrix X underscore S, where we have the standardized data series. Yeah? So if you, if you multiply this guy here, which is one by five times this vector here, which is five by one, what we get is one by one, which is a scalar, yeah? which is a number. And we do this for every row. Yeah? We multiply every single row always with the same eigenvector. And this is how we construct our uh, the, the time series, yeah, the corresponding time series of the first eigenvector, which we denoted in our lecture as S1. Let us now do that. So we construct the corresponding time series for the first principal component, which is the which is the dominant eigenvalue in our data set. So let's call it S1, like in the lecture. It's a vector of zeros, which has the same dimension as uh, our data series with this capital T. Yeah. So we do something on the time dimension. So for T equal from one to capital T, so what, what do we do? So our S, S1T should be what? Yeah. I said, okay, we should multiply each row with this eigenvector. So we take the whole row at time point T, yeah. And we multiply it with what? Well, take we take all we take all increments, all arrays in the nth, in the last, which is the fifth, the fifth column. Yeah? So we have seen. This is the fifth column. Yeah? And we take all of them. And this is exactly what we code here. Yeah? We take all of them in the fifth column, and we do this from from the first row until the last row. Yeah? So we put them, we store them here in our S1 vector. Yeah? So we end this loop and now we can just plug it in. Let's pl plug it in here in, into MATLAB. And now let's plot our time series, our eigenvector. Yeah? And this is how it looks like. Yeah? So this stochastic process here, our first eigenvector, yeah. explains more than 50% of the overall variation of every single of, 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 of uh, these five time series here. Yeah? This is basically what it tells us. So all of these, each single time series here, loads significantly on this guy. Yeah? So this is what it tells us. Now we can also do uh, the same thing, of course, for the original time series, yeah, which is straight, straightforward. We can take the original data series and uh, do the same thing again. Yeah? Then we would get the, uh, once we know that the standardized uh, data vector, that, that there's only one dominant eigenvalue, 
So what we so what we know is okay that the uh, or that the um, original data series will also have one dominant eigenvalue, and we can do the same thing all over again. So let's now also do the same thing in another program, which is called eViews. Yeah, I have opened it here already, which is also a standard program used often in economics. So we go here on, on File, New, Work File. So we know our data vector has 486 observations. So 486, push the OK button. And now we have to import the data, import file from, and I have put it here already on the desktop. Yeah. So we push the uh, data button here because there we have stored on the first uh, side of the Excel file, we have stored the corresponding data, push the finish button, and uh, what we get are our strategies. Yeah? So we have SUI, the unexpected earnings surprise, re return on book equity, return on assets, gross margin, and asset turnover. So let's now collect all of them. Yeah, we have to push the CTRL button and then make a uh, left uh, the mouse click on the left side and then we go and open as a group. So that's now our, our data matrix that we operate with. We go on view, we go on principal components uh, and it gives us now, we can leave everything as it is because everything in eViews is already standardized. It's a standard program and now what eViews is doing is it spits us out the corresponding output. And this is exactly what we have seen in, in MATLAB yeah. Now eViews does it the other way around. It, it gives us the, eigen, the eigenvalues in a decreasing order. Okay. We have seen the matrix D, if you go back here, yeah, it gives us the uh, eigenvalues in a decreasing order and MATLAB uh, and eViews does the same but in a decreasing order. Yeah. So that's one of the differences. What we see also MATLAB, uh, eViews gives us already here yeah, an indication of uh, how much does this eigenvalue here actually, or the corresponding eigenvector, uh, ex um, explain the uh, variation in our data vectors, and here we see it's 0.52. But now you know exactly what stands behind it. Uh, we have to divide this value here by five, because we are using here, by default, this, the standardized series. So what we see here is, yeah, so we have now in an eViews, uh, it gives us obviously here the uh, eigenvector for this eigenvalue is here in the first column of PC1, it's called principal component 1, it's the first eigenvector corresponding to, the, to this eigenvalue. Here we see in the second column the eigenvector corresponding to this, to the second eigenvalue, and so on. So, but if you want to see, if you are interested only in the first one, because we, we see obviously here there's only one stochastic process that is that is dominant here because all the others are below one. Yeah, this is 2.62, much larger than one. So, and we are interested then in this guy. This is our S. This is our eigenvector that produces the uh, the uh, series S1 that we had here as well. Yeah. So, and, and you see, yeah, it's these are the same numbers. Yeah. You see 0 0.21, 0 0.33, and so on. And the same you see here in eViews as well. Yeah, this, it's, this is the same numbers. So here you see the uh, covariance matrix yeah, and it's exactly the same what we have seen already in MATLAB. Yeah. So what we can do then next is we can give us the, uh, the make principal components. So this gives us now the eigenvectors. Yeah. Sorry, once again, we go on PROC, make principal components. We have to give some names to total series if we tell them, if we call them or denote them PC1, which is the uh, corresponding, which gives us then the corresponding time series for the first principal component, PC1, PC3, PC, uh, PC2, PC3, PC4, PC5. Now we get all uh, five time series, yeah? So the corresponding eigen, first eigenvector, the second eigenvector, third, fourth, and fifth and push the OK button, and then this is what we get. Yeah. So we can, of course, then uh, go on, on view and descriptive st statistics, individual samples. Yeah. You see all of them are basically the mean is zero. 
Yeah, it must be like that. So and uh, let's uh, delete this again. So and now we go on uh, principal component, open, and on graph. So th this is what we see. This is basically the same. Yeah, it, it has the same patterns than what we what we have already observed here in MATLAB. Yeah, if we go on plot S one, this is the same time series. Yeah. So this is basically what we get out, and just to make sure, yeah, we um, let's one one more time take the descriptive statistics of our five uh, training strategies here open as a group and go on descriptive statistics for individual samples. So what we see here is that all of this time series here, yeah, they have a they have a kurtosis that is larger than three. Yeah? For instance here our unexpected earnings surprise uh, has a kurtosis of eleven. Yeah, return on book equity has a kurtosis of seven point seven. Yeah, we know from statistics classes that the kurtosis of 3 is the corresponding value for the normal distribution. Yeah, we also see that, that, that they are skewed. The normal distribution has no skewness, the skewness is 0, and we see here that all of them are somewhat skewed, uh, either to the right or to the left. Yeah, and the Jack Dara test here obviously rejects normality for all of them. Yeah, so what we see is that all of these time series are fat-tailed, yeah. We do not know what is the underlying distribution. What we know is that it's not normal. And we know from Nassim Taleb, yeah, the small clip that we have seen throughout the, in, the, in our lecture, that obviously it could be that these time series here, that our training strategies um, don't have a finite kurtosis. So, of course, in sample everything is finite, yeah, but it could be that these time series here do not have a finite kurtosis. Yeah? What that means is that our variance or that the covariance matrix uh, of our training strategies, of our data vectors, is sample specific. Yeah? What does that mean? If the covariance matrix of these guys here, yeah, if we go here on covariance, or we can also plot the correlation, so it, it could be that if you have a different sample, these values here are, are different. Yeah? Which, which means in turn that our that our um, principal component analysis is sample specific as well. Uh, so it, it could be that this linear combination does not give you the the eigenvector out of sample. So that's a problematic issue, and we will discuss this in uh, forthcoming lectures. Thank you for your attention.